Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the for the introduction. So today we're going to discuss when was asbestos banned in Australia? If a workplace needs to record asbestos, whether an inspection of asbestos in the workplace can identify all asbestos, and if there are steps that can be taken to prevent people from unnecessarily being exposed to asbestos during work on site. We will hear from Joe Morris from the Reflections Charity that is supporting and connecting fellow sufferers of asbestos related disease and find out what they do. We're going to uh, start with the first poll and if you can answer uh, the following questions, Sarah will, um, has put up the, the questions there. So do you think your workplace register records all of the asbestos on site? So four answers, yes, no, unsure, not applicable. So it will depend on what knowledge you have of your workplace. If you are from a workplace or if you're just tuned in and uh, a mum and dad, um, then that would be not applicable. All right, Mo most have voted, but I'll just leave it, leave it another 10 seconds or so, Malcolm. Right, thank you. And we're going to compare these answers at the at the end um, and see if there's any change. Once we get the answers, then I'll introduce the panel. All right, I'm going to show you those results now. So 35. I'm just writing this down now myself. Eight and six. So it's, it's it's an even split with people saying yes and no. So that's uh, that's that's an interesting uh, <clears throat> interesting set of results there. So let's proceed um, to introduce the panel and just make sure. So I'm just going to read out um, a, a short biography on on each of our panel guests and their um, their images will pop up as, as I read them. So I'm going to start off with Zane Baggett. Uh, Zane is a team manager, principal consultant for the HAZMAT practice in the Queensland office. He has over 20 years experience in asbestos and hazardous materials um, and has been consulting to both the uh, private and public uh, sectors. He holds both international and Australian professional qualifications in asbestos risk management, and he has supervised several large complex uh, asbestos removal projects and assists clients with the development of asbestos related procedures and policies, asbestos management plans, and Zane is a licensed asbestos assessor. Zane, if you can turn your camera on, that would, uh, if you haven't already. Um, Cassandra um, is, um, Cassandra Ferdinand, Ferdinand is a senior consultant in our New South Wales HAZMAT office, or Green Cap office, should I say. She has over 10 years experience in hazardous materials industry and has a strong practical experience in this practice. Cassandra has been involved in some of New South Wales significant asbestos and hazardous materials projects, such as hospitals, government infrastructure, heritage, rail development projects, residential commercial properties, and a significant uh, significant involvement in demolition of an old power station. Her experience includes surveying, uh, asbestos monitoring clearance inspections. She is a NADA approved signatory for asbestos fibre counting and bulk identification. And she has a large following uh, in LinkedIn where she regularly shares photographs uh, of her asbestos coll collection and unusual asbestos items. Cassandra is also a licensed asbestos assessor. Joe Stanick. Joe is a consultant in our HAZMAT team based in our Queensland office. Um, he has several years experience in consulting in the public and private sectors. He's developed a multidisciplinary uh, skills across property, uh, property risk in the management and compliance sector, uh, focusing cooling towers, asbestos audits, asbestos fibre monitoring and clearance inspections. And Joe has just been approved as a licensed asbestos assessor. This is... Um, based on experience and, um, and uh, time served as well. 
We also have Joe Morris. Welcome, Joe, from Reflections on our panel today. Joe is the Operations Manager and Company Secretary for Reflections. She's the driving force behind the foundation. Joe's passion for the cause was shared with her father, uh, Reflections founder Barry Knowles, and she's proud to carry on his legacy. Joe has a background in public relations, marketing and sales, and as a design consultant in a Perth-based building de and design company that she has operated with her husband since 2003. So welcome panel. Um, now I want to pose a question to you before we start. So looking at the photograph that we have here, um, this image, and whether it is a high rise building, city building, or whether it is um, a shopping centre or office complex or um, warehousing, um, is it reasonably foreseeable that the tra tradespeople that I've mentioned above in the scenario would encounter asbestos? And if so, how can this be managed? So first thing I want to do is really ask the question, when was asbestos prohibited in Australia? Uh, I'll take that one now. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. And I just wanted to also say a very warm welcome to all our webinar attendees. Um, as Malcolm touched on, I'm actually really passionate about this topic. Um, I guess it's because I have this forensic science background um, and pretty much investigating and identifying hidden dangers. It's kind of, I'm a little bit of an asbestos nerd. I actually, in fact, have one of my favourite items is actually this $900 box of asbestos snow, which was a similar product that they used in the movie The Wizard of Oz. So it probably used to retail back in the day for about 35 cents. But, yeah, it's a pretty quirky item. I actually have it here to show you. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can see that, but yeah. So uh, getting back to the question. Um, so Australia, in Australia, actually, asbestos was banned on the 31st of December, 2003. But despite that, we're still finding asbestos crossing our borders. Um, it's just unfortunate. The Australian border force is unable to sample or inspect every single item that's imported into our country. That might be due to short staffed or, you know, it's just a limited um, restrictions they have for that. So we can see as uh, the image displayed on the top left there, there's an example, um, which was from August of this year, in fact, which it actually had three of Sydney's new ferries, which were built offshore, um, were actually found to contain asbestos containing gaskets. So it's really unfortunate that that's happened. We can also see actually um, to the top right in 2016, a lead contractor which engaged an offshore subcontractor to supply and install uh, these roof panels. In fact, it was actually found that these roof panels were asbestos containing. And it's very unfortunate that the, con the contractors that were sheeting these pieces of roof up, so they were like drilling into them, you know, cutting them up and, you know, placing them as panels, ceiling panels or whatever it may be. And unfortunately, they they've actually been exposed to asbestos fibres. It actually, in fact, led to an audit um, of several other large construction sites across Australia. And it actually, um, that was from goods received from that same subcontractor. So it's pretty scary stuff that, you know, it's still making its way into our country. Um, as hygienists, we also see a lot of products which use talc. That have, been, that have also been imported. So with talc, there is also a chance of asbestos contamination, which is present in the materials. Um, this, this is usually mainly due to lack of quality testing and control in the countries that these products are actually manufactured in. Um, as, as I mentioned before, although um, asbestos was banned and it didn't, and it also included to, the ban of to use, uh, reinstall, reuse, sell, supply, store, produce or import asbestos-containing materials. 
The amount of imported and stored items we find out on the field is astonishing. The, you can actually head to the Australian Border Force website, which um, also shows a list of countries which uh, goods containing asbestos have been detected um, in the past, and you can also refer to that. Thanks, Cassandra. So I suppose the next question we need to ask is, does a workplace need to have an, as an asbestos register or do they need to identify asbestos? Zane, I think you might be able to help with this one. And you'll need to turn your microphone on. I apologise for my voice today. Um, it's a bit croaky. Um, so as a PCBU, um, the regs and codes of practice state that generally buildings up and up until the 31st of December 2003 do require to have an asbestos register and management plan. Um, the easiest way um, to sort of explain this, this process is on this next slide here. So the first thing you would need to do as a PCBU <clears throat> is to have the asbestos identified at the workplace, which is done through survey. Um, the survey should be undertaken by a competent, experienced person, which um, we will cover on later in this presentation. Um, any samples that are taken during that survey will need to be analysed in a NASA accredited laboratory. Um, <clears throat> this will then allow uh, a preparation of an asbestos register and management plan um, as per the code of practice and the regulations. Um, any asbestos that is found on site should be labelled um, to ensure that it's not damaged um, accidentally by maintenance workers. The register should be kept on site and made available to anyone working on that site. The register and the asbestos management plan need to be reviewed as a, minim a minimum of five years in most states apart from WA, which is on a 12 month basis. This allows you to obviously manage your asbestos on site. Um, and then if, you're, if you then sell the building, then you must then transfer that register over to the new owner. Um, <clears throat> going back to imported goods and, and the, the cutoff date of December 2003, this was actually a survey we conducted um, a few years ago and the building was estimated around the 2005 to 2006 construction date uh, and in that we did find um, infill panels within the ceiling void. Um, as you can see on, the, on this slide. So just because your building was constructed after 2004 does not necessarily mean that it will be asbestos free. Wow. Um, do you want to explain this slide, Zane? Okay, so this is a, an example of a a fairly comprehensive register. Um, it exceeds the requirements of uh, the codes and, and the regulations of what is required of a register. Um, so in this, we have the location, description of material, um, the type of material it is. Obviously, it shows the sample number where we've taken a sample, and then the item status. Um, showing whether it's positive or negative for asbestos. Um, our registers include estimated extent, which some uh, other companies do not include. Um, and then we also, as you can see, contain condition, friability, and disturbance. And then finally a recommendation at the end. Um, this one will be for a, a demo audit as all the recommendations um, are actually saying that the item should be removed if it's likely to be disturbed during so, proposed works. So Zane, you mentioned demolition audit. So what are the what are the types of registers and what are the difference between them? Can you briefly explain that? For okay, the so, <clears throat> so 
the management um, registers uh, are there for you to manage your, your materials on site. They're a non-intrusive survey. They can normally be um, undertaken during normal business hours with no um, effect on, on the running of, of your businesses. Uh, <coughs> cost is cost is is not as much as a demolition audit and it generally won't take as long. Um, there will be plenty of, of caveats and limitations in that um, as we as we don't uh, make any intrusive inspections of voids and stuff. The demolition audit is highly intrusive. Um, we make holes in, in walls and ceilings. We open up flooring and, and that and that sort of thing on these photos here. First photo you can see is where we've, we've opened up the ceiling um, to, to access the ceiling void and locate an asbestos flue pipe. Um, the ceiling was um, tested first and checked to make sure that it wasn't asbestos. Second photo shows us opening up uh, some pipe work. So we've taken off the metal casing and then assessed the insulation that's on the pipe work. Once we're happy that that pipe work insulation is not asbestos, we'll then remove that to check to see if there's anything below that insulation. These show um, typically how we, we open up walls on a demolition audit. Again, we check the wall first to make sure that it's not an asbestos material. Um, and then in the case of the, the photo with the showing the pipework, we actually opened up that riser duct. And again, we've checked the pipework insulation to allow us to then check below that all the way back to the pipe. Thank you, Zane. So I just wanted to enter that. I actually think um, it's really important to note as well that the demolition work code of practice also states that really it's all hazardous materials should be identified prior to a demo and refurb order. So not just asbestos, but, you know, lead, lead paint, lead dust, pretty much, yeah, any hazardous material. Thanks, Cassandra. So I suppose the next um, question we want to ask, so is it possible to identify all of the asbestos? Yeah, well, great question, Malcolm. Unfortunately, the answer is no. See, when we do a compliance or management survey, they have a lot of like limitations and that's mainly due to, you know, we want to maintain the integrity of the building finishes, you know, the integrity of fire doors and waterproofing, etc., And also safety concerns for us. So height access is, quite dangerous, you know, electrical hazards. When we're taking samples from an electrical board, we don't know the hazards that potentially are in there. So, you know, those are the kind of things that have, you know, limitations around those types of surveys. Um, as they mentioned earlier, that's why it's so important that for us, we conduct a demolition refurbishment survey. Um, and it should be done by competent persons, such as Green Cap, such as one of us. So, that's when we can actually access the heights, you know, de-energize electrical equipment and, you know, even use cranes. So I've got an image there on the top left, which is actually me um, hanging from a crane approximately 100 metres in the air, which was really freaky initially. But honestly, it was necessary because we needed to conduct an intrusive survey and gain access to this building's like side walls so we could get in there and have a look if there was any asbestos contamination present, essentially. So um, this also might include things like under formwork or pockets of floor leveling compound, things that, you know, we don't have licenses for excavators or we're not trained to operate excavators where they can actually get in underneath those kind of materials for us to have a look at an actual survey. So those are the kind of things you need to have a look for. Um, it's, I think it's also very important to note as well that where asbestos originally is applied, it's actually not always where it ends up. Um, so often we've found, you know, overspray of hand-lagged pipework and boilers 
you know, stuck around, stuck to floor and walls around, like that's probably due to cast off the application process. So then pretty much slapping that asbestos on and it just spraying everywhere, going into cracks and crevices. And then you have a contractor come 20 years later or 30 years later, and they're going to do some floor works or something like that. And basically they're they're putting they're actually being exposed and that's that contamination has actually come from a secondary source so you know it's those kind of things that you need to have a look look out for especially even residues from previous asbestos removals you know there a lot of the times we find like for instance pipe work that may have had an asbestos removal done 20 years ago and in in fact, actually, the standards have changed. The standards back then, what was okay and would pass a clearance back in the day, it's it's not always the case now. Now we have higher standards and, you know, more training and more knowledge of this kind of thing. So I think that's really important as well. Um, you can see on my image on the uh, right side and the bottom right and the top right, that shows a... Uh, some debris of some asbestos limpet which was actually applied to the beams of a ceiling and it's actually now fallen and ended up in the column um, of the building structure which is actually concealed. So I, I think actually it's very important for people working within the building industry, the importing industry, pretty much any industry that, uh, that they should definitely be trained in asbestos awareness. I think, you know, trained people would be able to identify potential sources of asbestos, such as the gaskets example I mentioned in my previous slide um, for the New South Wales ferries, as well as those roof panels in that hospital. So, Cassandra, um, how can we avoid um, these unexpected finds or these discoveries? How can we prevent this? Yeah, no, great. Um, I honestly think it comes down to two main things. So uh, the two key things is documentation and education. And what I mean by documentation is, I mean, like, make sure your asbestos or demo register is good and up to date. Make sure your trades and workers have access to the register well before their job starts so they can plan and prepare their works accordingly, essentially. And Engage a licensed asbestos removal contractor to remove asbestos according to the code of practice and regulations, just relative in their state, and they all differ. And also make sure the records are updated and maintained. I think that's key for documentation. And in regards to education, what I meant is, you know, providing, your, providing training to your staff on a regular basis, uh, making sure you have current inductions, pre-start meetings and toolbox talks prior to any work starting, really. And a good idea as well is offering a walkthrough of areas with all trades before work commences. That way, you know, you, you're, getting, you're doing everything you can as possible to avoid these unexpected fines. Thank you very much, Cassandra. So how long does an asbestos register last? Thanks, Mel. Yeah, so the asbestos register actually lasts uh, for five years, except for WA, as previously mentioned. Um, it actually applies to the asbestos management plan as well. Uh, so the regs actually state that the AMP has to be reviewed, which actually triggers the review of the register. So although it's five years, um, if any works are likely just to disturb um, asbestos containing materials and hazardous materials, uh, in any sort of areas that may be being refurbished or demolished, um, then a, a demolition or refurbishment survey or a Div 6 has to be undertaken prior to those works uh, continuing. So whenever an uh, asbestos container material is discovered, uh, the conditions changed, it's labelled, removed, damaged, sealed, uh, the register and the AMP uh, have to be reviewed and updated and it's very important to keep these documents uh, up to date uh, and in line with regulations and codes of practices. So, go on. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and touching on the demolition audits, you know, it's not it's not essential, it's not required, sorry, to demolition to have a demolition audit of a whole tenancy or a whole floor or a whole building. You know, these sorts of uh, audits and surveys can be targeted to 
to specific areas uh, and so that you know prior to the works happening so that we can find all the unexpected items and, and work can continue safely um, yeah and even though the regulations state that it has to be reviewed every five years uh, depending on the items that you might have on site it can be quite advisable to actually have them re-inspected and reviewed more regularly so if you have friable asbestos on site or sort of fiber cement sheet in a high disturbance area, five years can often be too long. Uh, damage and can be done or it can just deteriorate over time and potentially contamination can spread and affecting trades and uh, people within the areas. So even though we talked about five years and more frequently, does the person with management or control uh, need to continue the inspection regardless of the inspection frequency on the register? Yeah, definitely, Malcolm. I think it's, it's, it's very important for the person in control um, to know where all these asbestos items are within the building and to also have a walk over and, and review these items quite regularly and just to ensure um, that, you know, there's no sort of contamination or serious issues at hand. Okay. Okay. So what is a competent person uh, or what quality what qualifications do they require to need to take undertake an audit? So this is an interesting one, actually. There's, um, there's no sort of qualification for actually conducting an asbestos audit or survey uh, within Australia, except for ACT and Canberra. And um, that's actually only just recently come about. So it's very important for PCBUs to understand and the individual, the consultancy being engaged to do these types of works. You know, it's perfectly reasonable to be asking the consultancies to uh, if they've done these types of works before, you know, has the consultant that you're engaging been uh, completing these audits and surveys previously on residential buildings and um, perhaps you're engaging them to uh, complete an audit of a commercial building. Uh, if they've only done residential before, are they competent in uh, surveying a commercial building? Um, and this kind of spills out into the demolition and refurbishment side of things as well. You know, have they been only completing management audits and Div 5s and are they competent to do a, a demolition, a Div 6, and find all the asbestos on site that might be hidden away? And this also comes across to the friable work and the clearance side of things as well. Uh, in general, across Australia, um, if, you're, if the work's of a friable nature, then the consultant has to be licensed, a licensed asbestos assessor uh, to complete and do the clearance. Um, and it's very similar on the removal side of things as well. You need to have an A class or a B class license, friable and non friable. Okay, so that's interesting. So, what happens if you get it wrong, if you get the audit wrong or the clearance wrong? Yeah, so a recent um, situation came about in South Australia. Uh, safe work actually uh, had to investigate this case and uh, you can see from the photos I mean I pose it to the audience do you think this is a, a good enough uh, clearance uh, and it's safe for reoccupation safe work Australia South Australia they, um, they had to investigate this situation where um, the consultant uh, the asbestos assessor actually cleared the site and said that it was safe for reoccupation um, you can see there's clearly debris and um, so the event where well, the outcome is still going on is that the assessor was his license was revoked and further investigations and proceedings are continuing around it. Um, but you know you can see from this that if, if, uh, if you engage someone who's not competent and does clear the area um, it has potential outcomes as well for you know if this was done uh, cleared in a business you know if, and it came about that safe work had to get involved the business could close down and there'd be delays in construction you know things like that so joe if um the audience were going into a an area that was cleared hmm. how would those photographs look different oh well you, you wouldn't have any sort of debris here you know you can see with all the all the debris um, to the floor and to the timber struts, um, it just it just wouldn't be there. You wouldn't be able to find any sort of debris or 
ACMs left on site if it was cleared and removed properly. So no dust, no debris. No, no dust, no, no debris, no, no problems. I agree with Joe. I think that would be like spotless looking, I think. Yeah. Yep. White glove by the sound of it. Uh, Joe Morris, do you, do you have any comment to add there? Yeah, thank you, Malcolm. Now, I'm having problems with my internet, so if I drop out, I apologise, but thank you very much for the invitation and hello to attendees. Yeah, I'm not the expert that all the rest of you are by any means. In fact, prior to 2010, I knew very little about asbestos and I'd never heard of mesothelioma. But we're on the other end of it. We, um, my father and I established a support network because there was a need over here um, in Western Australia, and that's now expanded nationally, a need for networking and connection for sufferers, but also a need for more information and awareness and education in the building and construction industry. And that's very much the role that Reflections is playing at the moment, advocating for that. I, I see the other end of this, Malcolm, the sad end of it. One of the sufferers in our group at the moment, she's 54 and her exposure was when they pulled an office building down in Sydney. She was a business professional working next door and she now is um, final stages mesothelioma. Um, I was actually on radio last week and I was contacted by a father straight away within minutes of going off air to say that his son, who'd been a second year apprentice, they're from the ACT and we all know that they have very good training in the ACT. He, the father had done the training, so the son, the apprentice, knew about asbestos. That on the construction site, they uncovered some piping, dug up some piping with asbestos lagging on it. Now, the, the apprentice knew that it was likely to be asbestos. He questioned it with his boss. His boss threw it back at him and he ended up losing his job because his boss didn't want to be confronted with it and didn't want to handle it. So, I mean, I can 1-800 number that we recently took over from the Bernie Banton Foundation just last week. I had a call from somebody um, working on a construction site and he said, what happens? We came across asbestos and um, I can't find a... I've asked for a... Um, asbestos register they don't have one on site and no one's listening to me and I'm pretty sure it's asbestos where do I go so I believe that there is a gap I believe there is things that we can be doing better Cassandra you touched on it exactly education is key if people are not aware of it we can't assume that they're going to know these things mm. thanks uh, very much Joe we're going to now um, go to reconduct that same poll that we um, we had before. So thinking of what you've heard um, before through through all the presenters, do you think your workplace register records all the asbestos on site? Yes, no, unsure, not applicable. So it may be the same, it may be different. Um, Following this, I'm going to um, ask Joanne a little bit about um, reflections and then we will go on to questions. All right, just a couple more seconds, um, Malcolm. The... Oh, I can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answers are a little bit different. Okay, um, I think I'll show it now. Uh, let's have, oh, mm. um, oh, hang on, 14, 15, 50, so the yeses were 15% before and the noes were 14%, but they've shot up to 57%. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have another poll to, to address what that might be, but I think we might, it looks like we've got the message across that um, you can't find all the asbestos and I'm, I'm hoping that the, the other mes message remains that uh, we need to do something about it uh, and we'll uh, um, address that uh, hopefully through some, some questions with the panel in a minute. So I'm just going to move on to my, my, my next slide. And this is one that I use when I do, when I do training. Uh, and I have taken this from the ASIA, the Australian Safety and Eradication Agency site. Uh, and I believe this quote, to be accurate. 
by preventing exposure to airborne asbestos fibres, we could substantially reduce, if not ultimately eliminate the tragedy of asbestos related disease in Australia. So we, um, we're removing asbestos out of, out of buildings all the time. We'd love to say we're not putting it back in. There's obviously more coming out than, uh, than, than going in. Uh, the, what's going in is illegal and has to be removed. But um, uh, the panel, do you, do you agree that this is, a, this is achievable if we don't, uh, don't disturb it? And we get the experts in? Yeah, thumbs up or <laughs> big smiles? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I, I, um, so yeah, I'm, I, I, I use this wherever I can. Um, so we're now going to um, just introduce uh, Jo and just ask her to explain, explain a little bit about uh, the Reflections Foundation. And um, GreenCap uh, commenced the partnership uh, with Reflections uh, this year. 2020 uh, as a national risk management supporter, following a three-year partnership with the Bernie Banton Foundation. So, um, Joe, if you can um, just explain a little bit about uh, the story behind uh, Reflections, what sparked it. Also, we were talking uh, before this, you were talking about a fundraising uh, activity that's happening this weekend that's been consuming your time as well. So, Joe, I'll just hand over to you. Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, so as I mentioned, prior to 2010, I knew very little about asbestos, um, which just goes to amplify the point, really. As a building designer, I should have known more. It was when my father was diagnosed. He was your classic second wave um, builder, had worked with asbestos, um, and diagnosed with mesothelioma and given six to nine months to live. Dad ended up surviving seven years without treatment, which was literally a walking miracle. So um, he was challenged to write his memoir because it was such a unique story, Reflections Through Reality, which was launched in 2015, and that became a catalyst. Joe, we've <laughs> lost you for a moment. If you want... Uh, Malcolm, we can start on the questions and then if Joe right. comes back. We get, are you there, Joe? one more time? I think I'm here. Can you hear yep, me? We've got you now. I'm sorry. I'm having problems with my internet for some reason. Um, have you got me still? We've still got you there. Okay. So I don't know what you missed. I'll talk very fast. <laughs> my son started a pre-app in 2000. Uh, we've lost you again, Joe. We might... Um, carry on with with questions to the panel how's but... the internet sorry yeah sorry have you got me back or not yes, yeah. yes we have sorry we actually had our power out yesterday and it's affected our internet so i do apologize profusely um this event has come about through our connections with the building and construction industry and a realization that our apprentices and trainees are not learning enough so we invented this event where tradies and um, adopt in and sponsored to walk the catwalk with a model. So it's all fun and games. It's happening this Saturday night, but it's fun and games with a serious message. And it's a great way to bring the risks of asbestos to the big stage on the night. So I'd like to just do a plug because it happens to be in two sleeps time. Um, and there is opportunity for you to support the work we're doing. The funds from last year's event, we're actually developing an augmented reality module to accompany apprentice training. So the funds go to the cause. You can jump online and donate to a tradie to encourage them. Tax deductible and 100% will go back into the building construction industry where they absolutely need more knowledge, more education. And that's key for them to be able to make an educated decision. They may not always make the right decision. We know they're young guys often, you know, gung-ho, she'll be right, mate. But at the moment, they're making decisions in ignorance. And that's just wrong. They should have known about this many, many years ago. I actually believe that there should have been more of an awareness campaign way back when asbestos was banned. I agree with you. And some of us that are a little bit older and have got kids know that um, the apprentices and those people around that age just think that they're bulletproof and, um, you know, it's only 20 years old and don't realise that, you know, 
well, at least I've made it past 60. But anyhow, we shall uh, we shall move on now. So let's we'll address some questions uh, now. So um, what, we've just got a background slide up here where um, we'll provide some resources uh, at the end of this as well. But before we go into um, other uh, other questions, we had one uh, from Belinda from Nika, and she said a lot of Minor construction type work is carried out on dwellings, structures, maintenance and repairs, uh, installations, replacements of air conditioning, power, drilling, screwing, etc. And they use this technique of spraying um, shaving cream into a styrene or plastic cup, uh, maybe a recyclable paper cup these days, um, which captures the asbestos. And she's asked the question, um, is this an acceptable uh, practice today? So um, would someone like to address that? Yeah, Mel. Um, thanks for your question, Melinda. It's a great question. Um, while it is an acceptable practice, it's actually highlighted in the Code of Practice on how to manage and control asbestos in the workplace under the Safe Work Practice 1, I believe, drilling, uh, drilling of ACNs. So while that is an acceptable practice, that was, that was probably 20 years ago. So right, like in 2020, we actually have more appropriate gadgets such as this dust capturing uh, tool you can see on your screen. So I believe, I think this brand is actually called the Bit Buddy. So these types of devices, this particular one actually captures 99.7% of all dust from the flat surfaces. So it's Essentially, it's more efficient, it's more safer as it allows the user to actually use both hands and it actually allows for visibility as well. So you can actually see that, you know, all the dust is being captured into this device. It's clear. So um, I also just want to uh, pinpoint that, you know, this tool actually sh must be used in conjunction with our H-class industrial HEPA vacuum as well. So in that's to be used safely. A special special vacuum cleaner. Um, we we're not um, endorsing any particular brand of um, of product, but uh, there are many, there are many many on the market, and anything that captures asbestos sources is, is good. We've got another question here from uh, from Damien, um, and this goes to the to the training uh, that we talked about before for in this case uh, surveyors. In your opinion, panel, or, or, or panel, um, do you think that there should be some sort of regulation legislation that all asbestos surveyors should undergo industry training and be signed off to complete audits like the BOHS uh, training? Should it be mandatory? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'll, I'll answer that one, Malcolm. Um, yeah, I think it is a good idea. Um, it gives a solid grounding um, for consultants to, to build, build themselves around. Um, and it, is, it, it does require um, a lot of infield training, um, shadowing an experienced consultant. Um, I would also say on top of that, I think they should also really consider the all surveys are done by a NASA accredited laboratory for surveying the same way as all uh, air testing is is covered under that so that's another sort of thing to to think think about not only the training but the actual requirements of either the company or the individual being NASA accredited for surveying so Sorry, Val, I just want to say, I know in, um, at Green Cap, um, we actually have a really high standard of internal training as well that we um, have for all of our staff. So I think that's also really important to have that internal training as well. Okay. Right, rightio. So I think the answer to that question was a, a yes. And um, Zane, you've, that's one of the uh, international qualifications that you hold, isn't it? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, I've got the, the 301. Yeah. Okay. We've got one other question. We've got, um, we can still take a couple of more questions. Um, another one from Stephen. In relation to labelling asbestos, 
is there any standard for labelling in housing where they could be considered a workplace? Mm. One. That, that is a tricky one. Um, the regs and codes don't actually state that housing needs to be um, labelled or even have a register. Um, however, as we said earlier, if you're having works, refurbishment works done in there or, or upgrading of electrical stuff and uh, walls are going to be disturbed, ceilings are going to be disturbed, um, there should be targeted investigations into that. Um, I also think the regs as well, they state it's reasonably practicable. So wherever it's reasonably practicable to label, then yes, you should. This is not a, uh, Cassandra, it's not a workplace though. Oh, sorry, it becomes a workplace for the builder, but not for mum and dad. No. So, yeah, sorry, I was talking about buildings. <laughs> okay. Um, another one, another question from Anonymous. Old escalators. Elevators, shafts, switchboards. How are these accessed? Who would like to address that one? I don't mind that one. Um, yeah, look, it's, these we get these come up quite often, um, and it is a case of engaging a, a lift technician or an escalator technician, isolating these these items um, and having their help on hand at the time to get in and for us to have a look at the items. Um, so it is. A bit of a collaboration, uh, which is actually quite a positive thing because I've been on site and they've actually picked up a few things from me and vice versa. So it's uh, a case of engaging two, two, two people, two companies. Great. Um, so the, the, anything that um, the panel would like to add that hasn't been covered that you want to reinforce uh, or wasn't part of the uh, scope of the uh, the webinar. I could just jump in there, Malcolm. I know that this is about commercial industrial sites primarily, but I think the messaging is so much broader as well. And we're all residents. We all live in Australia, where we have such a high rate of um, asbestos-related disease. I'm concerned that you know all the lockdowns that we've been in and everyone home renovating. I'm sure we've all thought about that. We all need to be aware. Next week is Asbestos Awareness Week, and I know Green Cap and um, Reflections have got shared messaging that we're going to be putting out to the community. Jump onto our profiles, LinkedIn, Facebook, and reshare because. We need to be getting the message out there as broadly as we possibly can because there is not enough awareness and education generally in the community. Couldn't agree more. Um, anyone else? I've got one more question here, which is outside of the, um, the scope of the seminar, but it uh, we've got two more now. Um, just quickly, uh, how do how do employers protect their themselves from employees who may have lodged a claim, who may have been diagnosed with the, with asbestosis, when they have or may have been exposed at their house growing up? So we cannot give legal advice, uh, and we'll we'll curtail our comment to maybe best practice what could or should happen? Yeah, although we, we, you can't really pinpoint that time of exposure, we do sympathise with this scenario, like, yes, it's, it's actually unfortunate that that does happen, but all we can say is, like, as long as you, you know, doing your due diligence, you're doing everything reasonably practical, like uh, your documentation is up to date, maintaining your records, your workplace is marked or labelled and, in, and in a good condition, um, and you're providing your asbestos awareness training to staff, like you can only do your best to prevent this from happening. That's all we can really say. Putting good practices to prevent yeah. it. Yeah, and, and document that. I think that's probably important. Another question from Stuart. 
asbestos register reviews have to be undertaken every five years, or I think um, the panel said up to five years. Is this a full review or is this where the register has been updated due to a new discovery or removal within the five year period? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is a full review of the register. Um, it's recommended you get a competent person in um, to revisit all asbestos items that have been previously identified, reassess their condition, and then amend the register accordingly. Um, registers should be updated as you have removal works done and, and not just wait until um, you, you're ready for your review. And that could be as easy as just putting a line through and a comment saying, item removed. Um, also, if you've got an older, older register and you're not entirely happy with it, it is even sometimes worth having a complete resurvey of your building done um, if, you, if you are lacking confidence in what you've, what you've either had previously um, supplied to you or that you've inherited. Um, if you've taken the building over. Thank you, Zane. Uh, another question. In local government assets, such as buildings that are leased out commercially, does the recognised asbestos that sits on the web-based register, so in their asbestos register, does this material need to be labelled? Uh, electrical, so it's a leased building. Example is having eaves and electrical components. That doesn't need to be labelled. Uh, yet the, the the codes and, and regulations state that um, labelling does have to be undertaken, um, just because it sits on an electronic base database um, doesn't um, exclude it from being labelled. Um, the label is there to inform maintenance workers. Um, and other people who are working in and around the building that that particular area does contain asbestos. So it acts as, acts as a warning um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Um, I might just add to that. Um, Cassandra actually touched on it earlier about uh, labelling to be uh, reasonably practicable. So labelling things that are height restricted or not accessible, whether it's an electrical hazard or a mechanical hazard, uh, you know, you might label next to it. You're not gonna label brake pads and actually label the brake pads. Um, so, you know, that, that you need to take into that, that into account as well. Yeah, I know in the past we've seen uh, labels on the front of doors as well. So doors to plant rooms, etc. So that is reasonably practical. Right, thank, thank you. Um, another one that's come in from Jim. Is anyone aware of any information about asbestos being provided to the owner builder before the an owner builder's hang on, well, before the owner builder's license is issued? Is anyone aware of any information about asbestos being provided to the building owner. I'm just wondering whether that question is asbestos, asbestos training so that the owner builder, I, I, Jim, if I can uh, interpret that as um, do owner builders get trained before they do their work, whether they're refurbing or new build? Has anyone got any idea or, or opinion on what should happen? I have a very strong opinion, but you probably know what that is. Absolutely, be more awareness. As I mean, touched on before, I'm actually a building designer, my husband and I, and we're constantly on sites where there is ACMs. And unfortunately, more people have a lack of awareness than um, accurate awareness that they can make a right decision. We also um, often are, um, doing... Um, owner projects where they have to go and do their training for their. Um, have you lost me again? Yes, there at the moment, but it is difficult. We, um, Sorry. 
Um, and yet the courses that they do, no, there's not enough awareness in them, in my opinion, around asbestos. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up now um, because we're approaching the the, uh, the witching hour or the, or, the, or the time that we've had all allocated to us. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our special guests, Jay Morris from Reflections, for taking the time out of her busy uh, weekend, and wish her well with the uh, with the fundraising, uh, and and the Green Cap team, uh, Zane with his um, voice, he's done extremely well. Cassandra and Joe, we've heard that despite the banning of asbestos, it still finds its way into the country illegally, and Cassandra showed us that with just this year with the ferries. So if in doubt, you should get it checked out. All workplaces must have an asbestos register. This register must be maintained and made available to workers who work or intend to work uh, at a workplace and have a life not exceeding five years. And that doesn't preclude the uh, duty holder to continually monitor the condition of their materials. While it is impossible to identify all of the asbestos on site, we can still take steps to close the gaps and prevent unnecessary exposure to unprotected workers and the public. And that's the key. If we know that we've got gaps and we've got, uh, we put the protection on and we, we access, access these things that we uh, didn't access before, that's okay. They're not going to be exposed. It's when we allow the apprentice to bang a hole in the wall or his boss doesn't care, that's when it makes a difference. So failing to close the gaps and manage exposure to asbestos could lead to an asbestos exposure, which is totally avoidable in 2020. While I know times are tough for some Australians at the moment, if you can, please look at the Stiletto's uh, website there and uh, select a tradie, support and donate to the Steel Toes and Stiletto's fundraiser and help make a difference. As Joe said, um, donations of $2 and more are um, tax deductible. So uh, if, 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 you, if you can, uh, please do so. So prior to working at home, as Joe said, or at work, let's take the time to plan. Identify asbestos prior to undertaking your work and don't forget all the other hazards. And if it doubt, get it sampled. And if present, get it removed by a trusted asbestos removal contractor and cleared by an independent licensed asbestos assessor or competent person. So as shown on the screen, we've made uh, available uh, some resources which we sent out to you again. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, panel. Thank you for the audience. Um, I've enjoyed this and it's been great, you know, good, good questions, good discussion. Thank you thank very much. Stay safe. You. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, team. Um, there's just a link that um, has been mentioned. I've just shared it once again in the chat. It'll also come out on the email later today. So um, that's a green cap link with, uh, for an asbestos exposure checklist and importation guide. And also I'll just drop in here a link to all other, all future webinars. There's only a few more now till the end of the year. And um, there you go. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day and um, we'll probably meet again soon. Okay, bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.